Hello and welcome to season two of Moving the Needle podcast. I'm actually so excited about season one uh, that it's hard for me to think about season two, especially through the strange lives we have had in the last few months. But I am really excited to bring you another season of the podcast where we're going to bring more interesting and fascinating guests and their perspectives to discuss some of Canada and in fact the world's most wicked problems. Well, I'd just like to say welcome back, Senator. Uh, I have to say I'm very excited as well to be with you for season two. Uh, we can build off a very successful first season and, and as you said, bring on guests and topics that will not only inform our listeners, but we actually hope to challenge ideas, perspectives, and then find those solutions to these wicked problems. Right, and we're doing things a little differently this season. We're going to have a special mini series exploring the contours, the context, the reality of racism in Canada. So this is not surprising given the horrific and tragic hate filling, hate killings of the Muslim family in London, Ontario, and the discovery, the tragic discovery of the hundreds of graves of Indigenous children at the residential school system across the country. Further evidence, we believe that work needs to be done. We need to examine the problems, but we also need to delve into solutions to make incremental or lasting change, as the case may be. Yeah, definitely, Senator. Um, you know, racism is one of the most wicked problems of all, as we know. And you know, but I do worry a little bit. Um, you know, there's been a lot of attention, but are we really making enough progress? You know, we had an election here in Canada just recently. Racism was barely brought up. One of the major political parties didn't even mention it in their platform. So we may be making some progress, but I think we have a long way to go. Hello, everybody. So in the last 18 months, we've talked about a virus, the coronavirus, every day, every possibly every even minute of our days. But there is another virus with apparently no vaccine available for it. And this is the virus of racism. The death of George Floyd in the United States left a mark, I think, on the people, on the world. And, and we saw a significant number of protests, not just in the United States, but also here in Canada. And businesses and institutions appear to wake up and respond with, with ideas and proposals and actions. But now a year and a half has passed from the height of the protests. And, you know, I think it would be important to take stock of where we are and where we need to go on this, which is possibly the most wicked of problems facing not just Canada, but the world. And today to help us kick off this discussion, we're talking, we're talking to Dr. Kwame McKenzie. Dr. McKenzie is CEO of the Wellesley Institute, Director of Health Equity at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and a full professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He is a seasoned professional on how to recognize address systemic racism and has great experience and great insights on how we can actually move this needle forward. So welcome Kwam. I'm going to call you Kwam, rely on my own old experience and relationship with you. So my first question to you is, you know, as I as I said, we saw a great deal of protests, voices, people took to the streets, they raised their voices to end racism. The killing of George Floyd in the US, I'm curious to know why you think it had such resonance here in Canada. So yeah, well, thank you for having me and I'm going to call you uh, Ratner, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, and I'd love to call you Senator Ratner because that sounds so lovely. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think that um, 
it is interesting that when we even talk about it in Canada, we talk about the killing of George Floyd and uh, that kickstarting people thinking about uh, racism and systemic racism in Canada. Um, but the names of the people who have been killed by the police uh, of colour in Canada, the names of people maybe who have been uh, killed in shootings uh, uh, due to Islamophobia uh, are not names that we talk about. That somehow uh, we have to have protests south of the border that change, that uh, bring it to our consciousness north of the border. And somehow uh, we have um, the news juggernaut south of the border that convinces the newsrooms north of the border that this is an issue that they have to get behind. So um, there is nothing uh, new about racism in Canada. There have been racist laws, there are racist killings. We have the Ku Klux Klan here. We've got huge disparities between our racialized and non-racialized groups. Uh, and it's not surprising that um, once uh, the media got on board, uh, that all of those things that everybody already knew in Canada, the unfairness that's here, uh, capture, it captured people's imaginations. Uh, but I do think that part of the difficulty we have in Canada is that uh, despite all of the things we know in Canada, whether it's racialized populations, indigenous populations, that it takes the death of somebody from America to actually start us moving forward here. That, I think, tells us a lot about everyday uh, systemic racism in Canada. You know, I do, I really do think it is interesting that, um, that this uprising in Canada, if I may even use that word, originated uh, south of the border when in fact, we have such, as, as we well know now, today, uh, especially after the discovery of uh, the graves of Indigenous children in residential schools, this is very much a Canadian problem. But moving away from the spark, I want to talk about the fire. Do you think this movement is different? Do you think it will have some effect because I, I can remember movements, you know, you remember the Wall Street, the movement against Wall, Wall Street, it just petered out and died. Will this movement last and make lasting change? Well, uh, they always, people always think that psychiatrists have got crystal balls and we can see into the future and obviously that's not the case. Do I know that it it is going to make a difference? No, I don't. Do I think it could make a difference? Yes, I do. I think it could because uh, things have happened that haven't happened before. So uh, let's just think about not just the fact that uh, everybody knows George Floyd's name and people are actually talking about uh, anti-racism, anti-black racism. Uh, there are also things like the Black North Initiative that's been set up in industry uh, which is taking anti-racist and anti-black racism into industry and has, uh, you know, I think uh, 20 or 30 percent of the uh, st of, uh, countries list uh, of companies listed on the stock market backing it. Right. That's never happened before. There are alliances that weren't there before between indigenous and black populations. Uh, there uh, have been really tragic other events. Uh, such as uh, Islamophobic killings, as well as um, um, uh, as well as um, the uh, missing and murdered, and as well as the um, residential school uh, graves that have been all have coming together at the same time, and it feels like with that and with us recovering from COVID, that there is a very concerted movement for change, not back to the old normal, but to a new anti-racist normal. And so I get the feeling that there are enough uh, 
things going on in enough different places uh, that there will be um, uh, in that, you know, a, um, a, a movement forward this time. Could it peter out? Almost oh, definitely it could peter out. Uh, but I think there's a critical mass. Um, and I think that critical mass could, uh, you know, with given the right strategy, move forward. Great. Now, I'm wondering with that, I, I, I'm, I'm curious your, your reaction to this, um, Doctor, that um, you know, we just had an election in Canada. Uh, we had a situation where racism, diversity, inclusion really wasn't on the ballot. You know, people didn't talk about it. Now, there may be reasons for that in the sense of, you know, uh, the composition of our journalists or the political pundit class not being maybe as diverse as we we like. Um, but, you know, we also had a, one of the major parties not have it you know, uh, diversity, inclusion, racism, indigenous in their platform, right? So there wasn't even there. Do you see that as a as a step back or just a, a blip in the road? Or you know, how do we how do we sort of assess that that situation? Okay, I'm going to say two things come to mind. First thing is, I looked at the lead, leaders' debate going into the German election. Yeah. Everybody was uh, middle-aged and white, all of the leaders. They had many more parties, but there was no diversity at all. I look at the leaders' debate for the English uh, elections, all of them white. And I have a look at the uh, leadership elections for, for the Canadian federal elections. And uh, we have a black woman and we have a South Asian man, okay? Uh, no one else is in that situation, right? So, uh, so just the optics of where we are and the optics of actually having diverse leaders puts us a step ahead of just about everybody, right? The question is, how do we use that? And um, yes, it wasn't on the election platform, and you'll remember that uh, 83% of people in Canada do not think that uh, discrimination against black people is a problem at the moment and don't think racism is a problem at the moment. And so the uh, political numbers are the political numbers. So it doesn't surprise me hugely that it's not sitting there on the agenda. Uh, but I don't think that means it's and, and they may think it's not a vote getter and it doesn't discriminate them from any other parties, uh, apart from, of course, one of our parties, which is openly racist. Right. Um, so I, I think, you know, people may not think that it's uh, that the numbers work, but I don't think that the issues go away and the growing diverse and racialized population mean that it is always going to be an issue going forward in Canada. And so I, I think um, this was a pretty weird election, <laughs> just to say the least, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's not clear what the election was about. Uh, and sometimes, for me, it, I'm really happy when I don't see things that I am really um, interested in on the election, um, and mandates on the election discussion because it's sometimes difficult to have a decent conversation about things that matter in the election. I'm going to be more worried if it doesn't sit squarely uh, in the Queen's speech and mm -hmm. in uh, the, the, the work going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I will give everybody a pass on the election as long as I see it coming through elsewhere. Certainly, when when that speech is delivered, there are a bunch of legislators who will be looking out for reference uh, to racism um, and to systemic racism. You know, you and I know it exists, uh, but there are many, many powerful voices, including the voices of heads of major institutions in this country who say it doesn't exist. What is a simple but powerful way to explain it to them. Can you give us an example for our audience so it comes alive? You know, it is, I find it almost impossible 
that um, we're in 2021 and we have to have a conversation about um, sort of what systemic racism and whether it exists or not. Um, and it, it's difficult, you know, there are probably still people out there who believe the earth is flat uh, and the moon is made of cheese. Uh, it's at that level uh, because and then it becomes very difficult. How do you explain to somebody uh, who can't see uh, that if you go to, say, for instance, Toronto, uh, while the economy is booming, a uh, racialized population of Toronto have not had a pay increase in 20 years, right? And how do you say to people, well, how does that happen, <laughs> right? And, you know, when you look at uh, school exclusions, when you look at people not being hired, when you look at differential outcomes from healthcare, when you look at who is poor and who is getting poorer, and when you look at differential uh, policing, uh, and you know you 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 know those those things are very very clear. And if there's no system that is making sure that racialized people seem to be overrepresented with all of these problems, then I say turn around to people and say, okay, if this isn't systematic, explain to me how this happens. So rather than me saying to people, this is what systemic racism is, which I think um, is a bit of a push theory of how you convince people, I turn it around and I say, here are the statistics from Statistics Canada. Explain to me how that happens. Yeah, you tell me how that happens. It, how that happens. Is it just random that all of this stuff happens to racialized groups? Is it just random that it happens more to indigenous and black populations than anybody else? Is, is it random or do you have some other theory that explains this? Uh, because if you don't, then I think between us, maybe we'll come to the conclusion that somehow, yeah, there's something systemic going on. Uh, and I sometimes say to people, uh, specifically about the black population, that um, we bring people to this country and all of them want the same thing. They're all looking for a good life, uh, to be part of the Canadian project, making this country a better place, to bring up their kids, and make a bit of money and have a good life. That's, that's what they're all for, right? And if you look at uh, over the centuries, the same trajectories happened. First generation, it's been a bit difficult, difficult to get your feet underneath you and make traction. But their kids, the second generation, do better. And their kids, the third generation, do better still. That's what happens. Unless you're the black population in Canada, where the first generation find it difficult, but the second generation find it more difficult, and the third generation find it more difficult still, which means that if you are a black grandmother, you are less likely to have lived in poverty than your grandchildren. Yeah. So when everybody else progresses, the black population regresses. Why? Why is that? It's the same selection process for everybody who's coming into the country, uh, but it seems to happen and uh, for the black population. And it seems to happen whether you're from uh, the African continent or whether you're from the Caribbean. And the only and the main thing they've got in common is the fact that they're black. So I then say to people, explain it to me. <laughs> Yeah. Tell me how that happens uh, if there isn't something, some systemic interaction between black populations and Canada, which means that they don't thrive. What is going on? And um, then we start having a conversation, because if I start having a conversation by trying to convince people that systemic racism exists when they decided it doesn't, um, I probably won't get very far. Uh, and you know what they say when in France speak French. And so I try to say to people, well, what is the language you want to speak? 
you know, I'll start, I'll start with some data, I'll start with some ideas, I'll start with some things you understand about how people move forward in society. And then we can have a conversation about why you think that things do or don't happen. And then maybe we can get to starting to talk about my theory, which is that it's a systemic uh, discrimination. And I can tell you the reason why I take that approach is because there's this approach that comes out of uh, substance misuse uh, treatment, uh, which is called motivational interviewing. What used to happen in the past is that uh, doctors used to stand on one side and they'd say to people, you've just got to give up. <laughs> you've just got to give up your drugs, right? And they were surprised it didn't work. And so what people started saying is, well, no, what needs to happen is you need to assess people's readiness. Are they think just thinking about change? Are they ready to change? Have they taken a step and being knocked back? Or are they rearing to go? Yeah. And your conversation has to meet their needs. So you actually have to, if you want them to change, you have to move to where they are, take them by the hand and walk them through the stages of change. You can't just stand on one side and say, you know, um, you're wrong and now I'm going to prove it. That doesn't work. And so I tend to uh, try to be a bit uh, more open to other people's views, uh, even if in my heart of heart I think they're complete nonsense. <laughs> I, still have the I still want to respect the conversation and respect their position uh, because otherwise we're just going to be, um, you know, one side and another side shouting in a divisive way. It doesn't work. That's that's really helpful. I, I I'm very appreciative of the fact, Quam, that you return to evidence time and time again. Evidence being the the foundation of uh, understanding our society and, and moving ahead. Do you believe that Stats Canada should be doing more surveys to ferret out uh, 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 systemic racism and deprivation and discrimination? Or do you believe that we have sufficient evidence to make the conclusions that we need to make? I think that um, <clears throat> one of the things that's true is I'm greedy. So if one says, should we have one or the other? I'll say, <laughs> well, you know, I'll have both. I'm, I'm the guy who says, they come and they say, do you want cheese or do you want dessert? And I say, yeah, <laughs> yeah cheese and dessert. Uh, so I think both things. I think on the one side, uh, Stats Canada has a lots of information it needs to use. It does need to balance the negative with the positive in order to try and find out exactly what's going on, because it's very easy for them to fall into a, um, a to a certain extent, an exploitative system of just producing negative reports about um, racialized populations when uh, actually there's uh, much more variation that's available. But I think also they they often don't have disaggregated data. They don't have data that gives us uh, fine grained information about different racialized populations. Um, here's here's a, an example. Um, one of the things that we used to um, uh, be able to see is uh, again looking in a generational perspective. If you look at the um, South Asian populations in uh, in Canada and you look from uh, the first generation to the second generation to the third generation, we were seeing increasing rates of suicidal thought. And if we look in the uh, Chinese origin population and we go first generation, second generation, third generation, we see decreasing rates of suicidal thought. And so actually having those data allow us to really try and work out what's going on. We sound see the same in COVID. In COVID, we've seen the East Asian populations with very low rates of COVID, incredibly low rates of COVID uh, in places like uh, Ontario. Uh, and then we've seen other racialized groups with high rates. And so we get to say, well, what is going on? And once you start doing that sort of work, 
And the reason why I say we need both and is because we find out more about society in general by looking at what works, not only in racial, uh, for, racial, for racialized groups. So we find out more. We find out what works for racialized groups. We find out what works for society in general. Uh, and we find out also how to make all of our services the most efficient possible, right? Because uh, the most efficient service balance uh, service provision with needs. And unless we have those that information, we don't know whether we're doing a good job and whether we're meeting the needs of people. So I think StatsCan could do much more to tell us really what's going on in the country. I think they've got data that they could use better. But I also think that we should be creating many more uh, disaggregated data sets that gives us information on uh, racialized populations, but also income, uh, gender uh, and um, sort of sexual preference and uh, in order to really understand what's going on in Canada. Thank you. And I was I, I'm wondering um, to follow up on that, you know, uh, to talk a little bit about, you know, racism and health care. Um, and I wanted to get your perspective on that because I think it's 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 become an issue in the sense of, you know, in Quebec, there was an indigenous mother that would that died in a Quebec hospital. There's, you know, sort of this idea that that, you know, was a tragedy. The the government accepts it that it's a tragedy, but they don't accept systemic racism in healthcare, or, or in their in the society. And I think there's lots of voices, obviously, as the senator questioned that. You know, lots of people question the idea of systemic racism. Racism there is. From your perspective, what is race? What does racism look like in healthcare? Is it, you know, a, a contributing factor that we don't have the data necessarily uh, to look at, you know, how people are treated in hospitals, how they're treated, uh, you know, in community, uh, access to doctors, and all that sort of stuff is. Is it, you know, from your perspective, is there a racism problem in healthcare? Is it a leadership problem? Is it a lack of data? And, and how can we deal with this, you know, going forward? Okay, so uh, the Titanic. Titanic sank. When it sank, um, uh, 1,500 of 2,200 people on board died. And um, it's one of the biggest maritime uh, tragedies that there's ever been. Uh, but your chance of dying depended on uh, your age, uh, your sex, and the class of ticket you bought. If you're in first class and uh, you were a, uh, a child, uh, you actually had over 90% chance of survival. If you were first class and you had a woman, you had over 90% chance of survival. If you're a third, if you're in third class and you are a man, you had about 16 percent chance of survival. And that's because they had a one size fits all uh, a system on the Titanic. Uh, we hit an iceberg, go man the lifeboats. Problem was that if you're in third class, the uh, you were in an internal lower berth. So you had to get right up from the bottom of the ship, up the stairs and blah, 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 to get to the lifeboats. Very difficult when the thing's um, uh, uh, sinking. Also, the other thing which changed survival was the fact that there was a culture of women and children first. So not surprisingly, if you add being in a lower berth and women and children first, men are going to end up with 16% survival, whereas for women in first class and children in first class, 90% chance of survival, okay? So that one size fits all idea uh, is exactly what we saw in COVID. One size fits all uh, strategy, mm -hmm. which meant that um, if you were racialized, you had uh, ended up with four uh, three to six times the chance of getting COVID and three to six times the chance of um, uh, of dying from COVID in Canada. Uh, and 
that one size fits all is the one size fits all health service that racialized people deal with all of the time. Doesn't, you know, you can change the survival in the Titanic by giving more support to men in the lower berths, right? The lifeboats weren't even full. You can actually change survival in our health system uh, by giving more support uh, to racialized populations and low income populations, uh, and you will get better healthcare and better outcomes from healthcare overall. We don't do that. Mm. When it came to COVID, actually, when we were in the H1N1 uh, pandemic, studies showed that if you were East Asian, South Asian, uh, and especially if you're black, you're more likely to get flu and die from flu. In fact, you are 10 times more likely to get flu and die from flu if you were black in Ontario for the H1N1. We knew that information. When we came to COVID, we didn't even start collecting data until we were pushed to. Yeah. We didn't collect, produce uh, pandemic plans which met the needs of black populations. We didn't start working with communities to make sure they got the supports. And we came up with strategies which were definitely and clearly always going to disadvantage low income and racialized populations. That's what we did. Now, you could say that's not racism, that's just us moving quickly in a pandemic. Well, the truth is we actually know that we should have been collecting data because just about every public health standard say so. We also know we should work with communities because just about every public health standard say so. We also knew very quickly and early on that we had differential risk and differential outcomes. We didn't change what we did. We actually decided and we made a decision that uh, it wasn't important to actually uh, change what we were doing to produce equitable outcomes for our racialized populations. That is how racism tends to work mm -hmm. in services uh, that are caring services. It's not always what you do, it's what you don't do. And so people will look at and they'll try and they'll always try and find the racist. So they will see the indigenous woman uh, who has had uh, different differential treatment very clearly because uh, she's a racialized person. And they'll look at those stories and they'll focus on those stories. Meanwhile, the whole of the service is geared towards uh, white middle class people and not the population of Canada. And the people who are dying and the people who are not getting the service they need are racialized folk and poor folk. And we know it, but we don't do anything about it. And so from my perspective, one of the most important ways of thinking about modern day systemic racism isn't that there are a whole bunch of racists out there um, doing nasty things, though there are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is that you as a system see big disparities between racialized and non-racialized groups and you do not set up proper uh, equitable strategies to deal with the inequities. You just let the inequity slide because you don't think they're important enough. That is how racism is killing people in Canada. That's how it works. And if people can turn around to me and say, we did everything we can to make sure that that COVID pandemic was equitable. If they actually come to me and say that face to face, I'll say, now you're a liar because you mm. didn't you didn't do it right and people died who didn't need to die and i think that's quite important when people think about that they do have to look in the mirror and say did we actually do everything and if we didn't why because it's not always what you do 
it's sometimes what you haven't done that makes you that makes a, a, a difference. It's it's an interesting because it, um, you know you have this situation and 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 to be honest with you you know uh, a couple decades now we we we've been sort of you know especially people white people especially it's, you know the idea that we're colorblind we don't see color. You know that makes us not racist. We're 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 you know we see everyone as equal, but we don't then realize the impact always that uh, you know decisions or systemic racism is having on people of color. And and I think one of the interesting discussions that has happened, uh, you know, since George Floyd and the protests and that and that has happened is is to take away that idea of we don't see color, but then also which. Is it even more difficult for white people? I'll have to say this is is the idea of white privilege, right? The idea that inherently we have we are, you know, 10, 15, 20 meters ahead of the starting line for everyone because we are white people. So I I, I wanted to kind of get your sense from your perspective. What do you think about that discourse of white privilege? But not only that, but more about people feeling comfortable about being challenged on the perceptions that they may have had and the ideas they may have had that have given them comfort over the years to say that, well, you know, I'm not racist. I'm, you know, I'm here for equality. I want everything, which I think, you know, many, many people are, but they don't see it necessarily as, uh, you know, how things impact because they don't see color or whatever it is. So I think that I am, um... I'm getting old enough to be interested in uh, the discussion and more interested in the movement. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested that people want to have the conversation as long as the conversation about my privilege is not going to consume me. Right? Right. Uh -huh. So if, if the whole conversation ends up being, am I privileged? Am I not privileged? What do I do about the privilege? Now I'm going to be guilty about my privilege. Then no, actually, I'm not that interested in that. <laughs> like get over it and start helping other people because that's what makes a better society, right? <laughs> like move on, right? Yes, you're privileged, yeah? So how are you going to use it? I'm not having this conversation about am I or am I not privileged, right? You're privileged, right? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to use it? Me, I have a different privilege. I was, you know, become a doctor and things like that. Yeah. What am I going to do with that? How am I going to make the world a better place? Right. So I, I actually do believe that they, that, you know, it sounds a bit nasty, but yeah, you do have to get over it. I don't actually want to have long conversations about your privilege. I don't want to spend my time dealing with your guilt. I sort of want you to pay it forwards, right? Do something with it, do something, help people, move it on. And uh, yes, I do believe that um, this idea of being colorblind, um, forget the color and just leave the blind because that's what it is. Because the one thing is if you don't notice the people around you and you don't notice their needs and you don't notice their difference, then myself, I think you're not being properly Canadian because you're not being mm. properly sensitive, right? Uh, society is about our connections. It's about how we connect with each other. It's about how we communicate with each other. It's about how we help each other. And to do that and to do that in an authentic and reasonable way, well, yeah, you do have to know that people are different because you have to notice people. And that's the way of getting out of your skin and into the place between us which is where the magic starts in the world, right? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, yeah, white privilege. Interesting. Let's move on. Yeah. Mm. I, I think it's so interesting what you just said, the place and mm -hmm. the space between us. It can be, it can be narrowed, it can be widened, all depends on actions, as you say. Well, so one of I, the things, um, um, uh, is that the, um, you know, they sometimes talk about the mosaic, right okay. and what what the mosaic isn't um, and if you think about any mosaic a mosaic is not just a lot of um sort of colored beads or colored uh, things that have been thrown on the ground a, a mosaic is a picture that is made not just by the colors but by the space between the colors yeah 
that's how you make a mosaic. And putting attention to the space between is, is quite important if you want it to be a picture, uh, if you want it to actually work, as opposed to just being a random assortment uh, of different colours and cultures. So I think there's, we do have to think about how we navigate that space and not just think about ourselves and our own needs if we're really going to move forward as a society. So I'm really sorry I interrupted you. Not at all. I, I, I think this is an iterative conversation. We could frankly talk to you until the cows come home. You have so much wisdom. Uh, but I wanted to comment on the space between us in the sense of something that I feel is optimistic. I'm an optimist by nature. I'm an immigrant, have to be optimist. Uh, yeah. And over the COVID crisis, I did observe, uh, you know, what some people call, you know, the, the the softening of the hardened arteries, because they realized over the crisis that the people who were really essential for their welfare and their health were personal support workers, minorities, doctors and nurses, many of them minorities, migrant laborers without whose work food wouldn't be on the table, truck drivers who were, you know, coming from different parts of the world, meat packers, and so on and so forth. So I kind of noticed that there's a greater appreciation for work that went unappreciated unappreciated or even ignored. Am I being Pollyannish? I don't believe so. I, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, the, one of the, that uh, the pandemic made visible a whole bunch of essential work that was um, not visible before. And also the definition of what's essential changed. People realised that there are all of these people who they literally have taken no notice of. Yeah who are really important for their day-to-day -day lives and they're mainly racialized. And so I do think um, that people, there has been an appreciation um, and increased appreciation of uh, different people uh, who are out there. And uh, also an, an ability that is very, that, that has happened in Canada to start thinking a bit more about how, how you know whether and how you walk in people's shoes uh, and I think that's that's important. I did just want to say one thing because uh, I totally agree with you and this is going to may sound even more Pollyanna but as you say I always go for evidence. Um, the rates of Covid, uh, deaths from Covid in Canada were three to four times less than the UK Two, two to three times lower than the US uh, and low compared to many other high income countries. The policies in these in Canada and in all of these other countries weren't that different. Yes, there were delays in the UK and uh, there's increased scepticism in the US which are driving uh, numbers up. Uh, but a lot of the policies weren't that different. What was very different during COVID was the culture of the people and the culture of the Canadian people uh, is, I think, the secret ingredient which has kept our um, our um, uh, rates of COVID, uh, well, the deaths from COVID low. You know, nobody actually had to pass a law to tell um, some of our uh, supermarket chains to open early and just allow older people in. No one, no one passed the law saying that. No one passed the law. I remember somebody knocking on my door early in the pandemic and saying, we're setting up a group to find, a, find to do the shopping for people who can't do the shopping. Nobody passed the law to say that. Nobody passed the law telling you that you have to try and walk off the road and maybe in the gutter when uh, somebody was walking down the road with the, you know them and uh, a woman the pregnant with their with their buggy. You just you just like you just did it. 
and um, also nobody had to pass a law. One, no, no, nobody needed to enforce a whole bunch of the laws like they did elsewhere. And I think if people start realizing that whether it is our uh, economic downturn in 2008 or whether it is um, what happened in COVID, that there is something special about Canada that we need to cherish and we need to build on. Yeah. And that we can trust the people by and large, but we have to build that. Um, I think we get somewhere different because I do think that, as you said, you know, yes, people took people for granted. People weren't thinking about other people, but then they woke up and they started thinking, hey, well, just a second, you know, that person's important. And it's not just important to me, that person's important. Uh, and we don't need to go back to the old normal. We need to cherish those changes and go to a new normal in which when where, where we bottle that, we bottle community, we bottle uh, that idea that we understand that we're, we're, we really are all in this together. And I'm not being Pollyannaist and saying everything was brilliant and all of the other stuff, but there is definitely something there to build on and we should build on it because it's really important for us going forward. I, I take great hope. I am the kind of person who looks for points of light and you've certainly pointed those out to me. And in that context, I want to talk about language. Language can in, 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 in and of itself be racist. And I want to go back to those migrant workers who were unappreciated until the crisis, those personal support workers, etc. And I want to get your response to uh, frankly, one of my favorite ideas around changing the language from, you know, we have skilled workers, high skilled workers and low skilled workers. In the meantime, we know that there's no such thing. What we actually need is essential workers. So I'm trying to change the language and the discourse in Ottawa from high skilled and low skilled to essential skills. Do you think I'm being Pollyannish there? Can you give me some advice and hope? Well, I do think I totally agree with you that language is really important. And uh, the truth is that people need different skills. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that I would never have the patience to do that people say are low skilled. And even if I had the patience to do, I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, the truth is that there are very few jobs these days that aren't complex in one way or another whether they're complex because you have to, uh, you're um, facing the public and you need those skills, uh, whether they're complex because you need to continue concentrate, whether they're complex because, you know, they're not, um, they're, they're not very varied, but you have to make sure you produce quality all of the time and usually against a, um, a, a sort of with the delivery targets and so under pressure. Uh, they're all complex in, in one way or another. And um, yes, there are some people who are very good at um, uh, sort of academic complexity, and there are other people who are very skilled at um, being able to use uh, their hands. But the, the truth is that they're all contributing to Canada. And if that's the case, the question is whether you need stigma, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, labels which uh, stigmatize them as low skilled, high yep. skilled. Uh, I don't think it's useful. I think, um, and I also think that jobs change over time. Uh, and if somebody is working to their capacity to help move our society forward in Canada uh, and they're doing what they can, um, that's good enough for me. So I'm very much like you. I, I think um, that there's no need uh, for those sorts of labels. And we can uh, define jobs on, uh, you know, what the job is rather than inverted commas, uh, they are low skilled or high skilled. I can tell you that my academic work is um, a low skills uh, job. Uh, I have to think, but I actually don't have a whole bunch of physical skills. <laughs> so what does it mean by low skilled or high skilled? 
uh, I use my brain. So, you know, um, it's, it's, I think, old terminology that has to go. Let's hope we accomplish that or with, you know, trying to build a constituency around that. Um, mm. My last question. You talked about laws, that we didn't need laws to behave in a civic minded way to reach out to our neighbors and to help out. I'm a legislator, so I know the law can be really powerful. Do you think that our laws should be changed or strengthened to include um, aspects of racism? Uh, you know, we have hate speech laws uh, and we have the Human Rights Commission in, in Canada and in every province. Do we need more laws? I think we probably do. And the question for me is whether the laws are for individuals or whether the laws are, you know, what are the laws for? So I actually think it should not be legal to develop a public health strategy in a um, crisis such as uh, COVID that we know is going to be discriminatory. That should not be legal. I also believe it shouldn't be legal to develop uh, healthcare systems that we know will work for some people and not for others. That should not be legal. And I think there need to be better protections uh, for uh, rate against uh, for discriminate uh, uh, for racialized populations uh, against um, a systemic discrimination. There was a, an interesting law in uh, the UK uh, from I think about 2005 called the uh, Race Relations Amendment Act. And um, th what it said was that uh, public bodies had three um, duties. One duty was to promote positive race relations. The second was to offer equitable service. And the third was to be able to prove that they'd offered equitable service. And if they weren't able to do that, they could, they would be taken to court. And this wasn't a human rights courts with small amounts of fines. This was um, sort of open court where uh, the possible fines um, would, depend, would depend on, on the court. Uh, there are right wing think tanks um, and uh, such as the Auto Audit Commission in the UK, which doesn't exist anymore, uh, that analysed the impacts of the race relations amendment law and came to the conclusion that this was uh, the most uh, positive law that there had ever been for health equity in the UK. And uh, this is because uh, that in health services at that time, um, risk was a real issue. And if you thought that your organisation was going to be at risk, yeah, could be prosecuted, um, your, your legal representatives in the organisation said, listen, you've got to do what you have to do to comply. So you have to collect data. And once you've got those data, you actually have to analyse them and show that your services are equitable. And if they're not, you actually have to change your services. <laughs> right? And so that one law led to a whole chain of uh, reactions which changed the way the services work. And so I think that smart laws that um, support people's ingenuity and actually help people to uh, move in the right direction, I think, I think can be very, very helpful. And the lack of those laws, um, I think um, I have difficulty with. I have difficulty with the idea that the federal government gives provinces uh, funding and does not check whether the, that funding uh, actually promotes uh, equity in uh, Canada or not, which is obviously one of the things that the federal government should be thinking about. So I think I think some laws um, would be useful in my mind. That that is so useful for me as a legislator. I, I'm really going to look into this UK, UK law and just as an observation, I'll put a little idea. It would be wonderful to have you as a colleague in the Senate. 
So thank you, Dr. McKenzie. I hope you take that little idea away with you. Thank you to our listeners. Uh, if you have questions about this podcast or you have proposals or you'd like to speak on our podcast or suggest someone uh, who should, please do write to me and let us know. You know that we would love to hear from you. And thank you all. And again, thank you, Kwam. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been great speaking with you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.